When it comes to evaluating a rock mass, the quality of a rock mass, one of the most useful methods that we have is the rock mass rating, and its utility comes from its simplicity and the ability to kind of customize it for individual applications, right? I'm going to be going over what the original rock mass rating system included, but there have been many additions or slight variations of this, this skeleton that I'm going to describe to you. And that, again, just goes back to how kind of versatile it is. And going back to its simplicity, all that the rock mass rating is is a sum. The final number that describes the quality of the overall rock mass is just a sum of all of the individual components, right? So if we say each component is X and it's numbered right, then the final rating is going to be the sum of all those, right? And the final score is going to be out of 100. The ratings that you assign to these, you can find them tabulated in different, different literature. But ultimately, they'll add to at most 100, with 100 being very good rock, and then down to 0, with 0 basically being like dirt. I don't think any rock actually goes down to 0, but the lowest number is going to behave much more like, like soils than, than actual proper rock. And remember, rock mass is different from rock. I discussed this in a previous video. So when we talk about how we're rating this, we're not talking about individual pieces of rock. We're talking about big in situ rock mass that you might be tunneling through, mining through, you know, putting some big dam into or something like this, right? Big, large scale excavation projects go through rock mass. Uh, what you would see in a laboratory setting or in a museum would be an individual rock, right? But let's just get into it now, shall we? Rock mass rating or RMR has several components. Really, five are the, the fundamental ones that were in Binyavsky's original RMR system. The first of those is going to be the rock strength. And when I say rock strength, I mean, yes, the individual rock. So I discussed this as well at length in a previous video. But when we talk about rock strength, we're talking about either a UCS, uniaxial compressive strength, or a TCS, a triaxial compressive strength. Or in some select cases, maybe a, a, a tensile strength. So you would estimate that with a with an indirect tension test, probably. But you know that's your usual stick it in a compression cell, right? Whether that's uniaxial or triaxial, and it'll eventually fracture, and that'll get you a number that corresponds to a stress that you should not push this rock past. One test is usually not very good, so ideally you would have access to a whole database of different tests on the rock, and you could use a summary statistic like a median or a mean or something like this, right? But that rock strength, again, that is that describes the strength of the rock type, but because the in-situ rock mass is so much more, there's so many more variables than just the rock strength, this is only one portion of the overall rock mass rating. So the second piece is going to be what's called RQD. And that stands for, and this, I'm not a huge fan of the name because it doesn't really fully describe what it is. That stands for rock quality designation. And it's like, well, that sounds very generic and nondescriptive. And you'd be right, rock quality designation. I prefer to think of it as drill core quality which would be, what is that, DQC, drill core quality. That's what I would have called it, but RQD, that's, that's what it is, rock quality designation. Because what this is, is when you have a whole lot of core, right? You've logged all this core, brought it up in these boxes, right? All of this. Generally, what you can see in it is fractures that existed before drilling. You have to be careful because especially with bad operators or whatever, you'll have drill that breaks or, you know, shifts in rock type and the drilling, all of a sudden the drill starts spinning or you run into a lot of water, you know, things that change the mechanical properties uh, of the drill interacting with the rock rather than the rock itself, right? So you got to look for existing real fractures and I might do a separate video on this, but generally you'll look for things like presence of alteration or, you know, uh, uh, weathering rather than kind of fresh looking uh, faces on the on the drill core. But really all that RQD is is it's a sum of all comp of all the pieces of rock in a drill core that are over two inches in length. So eh, there's no real easy way to write this pieces greater than two inches for my non-American friends or people who don't use our good old 
U.S. standard system, you can convert that, what, a, an inch is 2.5 centimeters, so 2 inches is probably about 5 centimeters. It's the sum of all pieces over 2 inches divided by the total length of the core. So again, these are, these are lengths, I should specify. When I say the sum of the, all the pieces over two inches, I'm not talking about counting up the number of pieces that are over two inches in length. I'm talking about the length, right? So you'll come in with a tape measure and measure all the individual components. So if we're measuring a total, like let's say that these two pieces of core here make up 10 foot, so they came out in five foot segments. And we had a break here that has a little piece that's say one inch and then a break here that's another piece that's one inch and then a break here that's maybe half an inch, 0.5 inches, right? Then this equation is pretty simple. All you would do is say one inch plus one inch plus 0.5 inches. So that's 2.5 inches divided by 10 feet. And again, feet to inches, right? That'll be 120 inches. So I don't know exactly what that is, right? But you could calculate that out and you would get a number. Simple enough, right? So basically that's that's saying that we have to account for all of these fractures. The presence of, of fractures that existed before any mechanical fracturing by the drill. And we say the more of those that there are represented by the more frequently we see uh, small pieces of rock less than two inches within this core, the worse the quality is going to be, right? So you want a high RQD. In this case, this would be a very high RQD. This would be, you know, 90-something percent, and that's good. But if you had, say, a lot of little breaks in here that created a huge section of a bunch of little itty-bitty rubbly pieces, then all of a sudden you're dropping down to, say, 60 percent, 70 percent, even lower RQD, right? And that's going to be that's going to be trouble for, you know, if you're trying to have a stable excavation around this thing. So that's enough on RQD. Maybe I'll do a video dedicated to that just to give it a little more detail because I think that that felt maybe a little bit rushed. But the third piece that we're going to look at is the spacing of discontinuities within the rock. So spacing of discontinuities. And when we talk about discontinuities, remember we're talking about joints, joint sets, faults, fractures, discontinuities. We're talking about all these things that represent either a mechanical break, a break in the lithology, something that represents a surface along which motion can occur, right? That there might be shearing along these kinds of things. Discontinuities, right? So our usual way of measuring this is going to be in the field, and that's going to be one of the most common ways will be what's called a scan line survey. So this is not done it can be done in the core as well, I should say. So going back up to our core here, before we jump in with the, uh, with the scan line survey, in our core here, if these are all discontinuities, it's better to have them spaced out, right? Like before I drew all of these in here, if we had just these two fractures, they'd be some five feet apart or something. That's pretty good. But once we have areas like this where there's a bunch of little discontinuities all right next to each other, that's bad. And that's because they make, think of rock mass as similar to a, to a, you know, a linkage, an assembly. The overall thing is only as strong as the weakest link, right? It's going to fail along the worst area. So very closely spaced together discontinuities at any point in the rock mass are going to be really bad news for us. So generally, we're going to be looking at, you know, six feet and above is going to be pretty good. Maybe one foot through six foot or, you know, two foot through six foot, pretty okay. Once you start getting into the less than a single foot spacing along these things, then you're talking a pretty, a pretty tight space. So getting back to the scan line survey, right? If you're in some tunnel here, then what you would do is you'd set up a, a tape measure or some measuring device along the rib, you know, measuring at certain intervals. Here's you in here, a little stick person. And you'd be looking at the rock and saying, okay, maybe there's discontinuities here, maybe there's little joints kind of running along here. I'm just kind of drawing stuff. You know, you look at how frequently there are fractures intersecting these uh, intervals here. 
right? So you could take a one foot interval, say each of these uh, spaces here is a single foot. You could measure how many discontinuities intersect that single foot interval. And then you could get an estimation of what that discontinuity spacing in the rock at this particular point in the excavation might be. And again, of course, we want more widely spaced discontinuities. If stuff's much more close together, right, it has the ability to fall out and fail in a bunch of little pieces instead of if it's just a few big pieces, then we're going to have a much easier time bolting it to another big piece of rock or to the larger rock mass, right? So more spaced out equals better, closer together, much worse. So if we again scroll down here, the fourth piece of RMR is going to be the condition of the discontinuities. Condition of discontinuities. And that's when we're talking about, okay, are these heavily altered? Are they infilled with anything? Discontinuities. can never sleep on that word, that one. That one always gets me. If I'm not thinking about spelling it, I will mess it up. But things like, you know, what's the surface roughness, right? We look at roughness. If you think of things locking together and how likely they are to fail in sliding or shear, right, you generally want your discontinuities to be rougher, right? If you have, you know, and this is kind of a little bit contrived, but, you know, if you have surfaces like this, right, and you're talking about them shearing against each other and, and sliding apart. There's a lot of little surfaces and indents that are going to cause friction and going to give it some resistance to sliding, right? So we want them to be rougher as compared to if you had two completely smooth surfaces butted up against each other, right? Especially if these are maybe a little bit moist or altered with, you know, really smooth clay or something, then they're going to slide super easily, right? So roughness is generally good. When we look at alteration or weathering, right, that's going to be interesting. Generally, weathering on its own will smooth out the surfaces, which is bad. Uh, but weathering can also, of course, introduce chemical weathering, which will alter the minerals that are present. And sometimes these are good, sometimes these are bad. Sometimes you'll have a lot of uh, little crystal faces. Sometimes they might be kind of calcitic, right? little deposition by water so calcite and if it's formed a lot of little mini crystals in there those can give it some good friction uh, but of course calcite has multiple crystal forms and habits and sometimes they might be smoother so this is really you know with alteration you're gonna have to look more carefully of course clay alteration is never good if you've altered some of the surface you know like with granite sometimes you'll alter the the um what am i thinking of the orthoclase, the feldspar minerals into clays, you know, kaolinites, and those will end up being much weaker and slide along each other much more readily, especially again in the presence of water. And then also you'll look for things like uh, infilling as a third piece of the condition. And infilling is different from alteration. Alteration may be from chemical weathering, right? Infilling would just be, you know, some water came in and dumped some some sediment, some gouge or stuff broke apart and you have maybe some fault breccia infilled in a gap, right? And again, this is usually going to be pretty bad, uh, especially if it's clay gouge. Um, that's not good. Clay gouge is going to be the worst there. And again, if it's, if it's infilled instead of just altered, then we can expect to see quite a bit more of it, you know, greater thicknesses of this stuff, which is going to be really pretty dangerous for us. It'll allow us to fail and shear much more easily. And then finally, with the conditions, we have something called aperture. Aper, is it aperature or aperture? I actually don't know off the top of my head. Someone can fact check me on that real quick. Aperture, which is just the distance between uh, a discontinuity when you see it, right? So if you're in the field uh, underground or looking at a rock core, right, you can look at a fracture and see, you know, what does the spacing look like? Do they fit together nicely or can you fit you know, generally you could look at things like, you know, can you fit a fingernail in there? Uh, can you fit the tip of a pencil in there? Things like this, you know, things that you might have on you that you can readily test in an in-situ environment. And of course, generally speaking, the closer they are together, again, there's going to be greater friction there. The farther they are apart, it's going to be worse. So you want them, you want them to be small, a small aperture, that distance between the two. 
We want that to be as small as possible. Okay, going on to the fifth and final piece that's included in Binyovsky's original rock mass rating system. Let's shift ourselves a little bit over to the left here. The fifth piece is going to be the presence of groundwater. And I talked about as far as rock strength and the stresses go, groundwater is never good, right? But this is basically looking at, okay, is it dry? Is it damp? <laughs> the original system uses these exact words, right? Is it dry, you know, as an estimate of basically like inflow, how many cubic feet per minute or, or cubic meters per second or whatever metric of volumetric inflow you're going to use. Uh, how much water is coming in? Generally speaking, it's kind of difficult to estimate this. If you're just going down and doing a rock mass evaluation, you're not going to have the time to try to measure it. Some people get pretty good at estimating these just by looking at kind of where water might be inflowing. Uh, of course, if it's dry or damp, you wouldn't really expect this to be the case, that there would be any uh, inflowing water. You can just kind of feel from the surface of the water. Uh, you can look at, sometimes you can look at uh, where paths of least resistance for water might be and where it might be collecting. That can change the way you rate it. Uh, dry, damp, wet, dripping, or flowing are going to be our five terms here. And it should go without saying, but water, despite being good for life on Earth here, despite being what sustains us and all of our animal companions on this planet, groundwater's bad in rock, right? It's going to weather things and and degrade your rating up here generally it's going to be an agent for reducing the roughness increasing alteration uh providing infilling and even you know through weathering spacing out the aperture as well but then also it reduces again that effective or it increases i should say that effective strength by reducing the strength of that rock uh, which is bad it reduces its re resistance to shear you can think of it as as lubricating right as lubricating the rock and making it more willing to fail more ready to fail along a shear plane so again to recap then and put all this together in a final statement for the end here each of these components is rated on a different scale right so rock strength depending on what number you have is going to be a number from 0 to 15 RQD is going to be a number from 5 to 20. Spacing of discontinuities is going to give you a number. Let's see, that's going to be between 5 and 20. And the condition of the discontinuities is going to be between 0 and 30. So again, you can see the weights that the original system places on these different things. And you can play around with these as you see fit. Again, this is kind of a general case, but with such a large range on the condition of discontinuities, you know, losing a lot of points in that category will be much more devastating than, again, looking at like the rock strength, that's 0 through 15, right? Despite that being one of the ones that more scientific types might want to lean more heavily on it's it's rated the lowest in this system and then finally groundwater again is going to be 0 through 15 like the rock strength so looking at all of these right 15 plus 20 is 35 plus another 20 is 55 plus 30 is 85 and plus another 15 is 100 so again you can have a max Max RQD, or excuse me, RMR, not RQD, is going to be equal to 100. That is going to be the greatest number you can achieve, and that's going to be very good. And then below that, in increments, you go from very good to good to fair to poor to very poor. Okay, we'll have a little more time to discuss this system. Maybe break down each of these individual components in a little more detail, because I feel like I was... A little bit brief on some of them. I could do them a little bit more justice here. But those are the five components of RMR. Those are the big things that people first thought we would be best off looking at when it comes to grading a rock mass as a whole compared to just a regular rock type on its own. So I hope that was informative or good review. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And stay tuned for more exciting rock mechanics stuff coming up real quick. See ya.